Today, we will be performing the abdominal examination and I will be walking you through each of its steps. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Shahzeb. Can I know your name, please? Ahmed. Okay, Ahmed. I will be performing the abdominal examination on you today. In this examination, I will need exposure from your mid chest down to your lower abdomen and I will be using my hands and my stethoscope to feel your abdomen. Is that okay with you? Yeah. You will not be feeling any pain or distress during the procedure. If you do so, then kindly let me know. Can we begin now? Yeah. Like any other examination, the abdominal examination has got four components. Inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. Beginning of an inspection, we need to first look at the general look of the patient, seeing their status, whether they are in any distress, their built, and then we'll need proper exposure for the inspection. On inspection, we need to look at the abdominal shape, the symmetry, and assess for the breathing pattern of the patient. Most patients have got abdominal thoracic breathing pattern, where the abdomen moves with respiration. Also, the ideal way to inspect is to go at an eye level both on the side of the patient and then from the foot end. I will be demonstrating that right now. Two special maneuvers can be performed on inspection to evaluate for any lumps or swellings. The first one is called the Carnet's Maneuver. The second test is called the Cough Test. During the Cough Test, we ask the patient to cough and observe for any visible bulges or swelling. This indicates a fascial defect through which a peritoneal outpouching is coming through. This is called a hernia. We can see that in the abdomen as well as in the inguinoscotal region. So while the patient is coughing, we'll inspect both these regions. Can you look to that side and cough for me? Can you cough again? Thank you so much. Once the inspection is done, we'll now move on to the second part, which is the palpation. Now, for palpation, we need to make sure that the patient is relaxed, that the abdominal wall is not tensed up. For these things, you need to make sure that the hands are warm. The patient is not anxious and if this, these still do not work out, we can ask the patient to slightly flex at their hips. This will relax the abdominal musculature and help us in our palpation. Palpation is divided into three parts, superficial palpation, deep palpation and visceral palpation. For all the three parts, we need to make sure that we look at the patient's expressions to see if there is any grimace or flinch for pain and also ask the patient if they feel any pain and they can tell us to stop. Do you have any pain at any site in the abdomen? Okay. If the patient does complain of a painful site, we need to palpate it at the end. This is important, otherwise the patient will be discomforted and will also cause guarding that will interfere with our examination. So moving on to palpation. We we'll warm our hands. If you feel any pain, do let me know. Right? We'll begin by palpating in the right lower quadrant, we can actually do it in any direction, but ideally an S-shaped maneuver is done to make it easier. It's important that we palpate with the bulk of our fingers superficially to look for any tenderness and we'll look at the patient's expression at the same time. Once superficial palpation is done, we will now move on to deep palpation. This is important to assess any deep lumps within the cavity and to assess for deep tenderness and rebound tenderness, which is indicative of peritonitis. For deep palpation, we will follow the similar course, but just pressing deeper as the patient breathes. Again, looking at the patient's expression at all times. Once deep palpation is done, we can now move on to visceral palpation. 
This involves four organs, the liver, the spleen, kidneys, and the bladder. For liver, the lower border can be palpated if there is enlargement. It can be normal in some individuals or it can indicate pathological forms. Palpation of the liver or any other organ is ideally done by the radial side of your index finger. This is the most comfortable position for the patient. The orientation should always be with the costal margin. So if there is, we are talking about the liver, when we have the right costal margin, we have an orientation of our hand in the same direction. We will start from the right lower quadrant. And the key to this is to keep your hand static when you push it in. We'll push it in during expiration and ask the patient to take a deep breath. On inspiration, the diaphragm moves down and if there is enlarged liver, it will come and strike the radial side of our finger. This is best done slowly to assess for Mr. Megali. Can you take a deep breath in? Exhale. Another deep breath in. Exhale. We need to move an inch upwards on each palpation so that we can assess the lower border of the liver. Again, please. Exhale. Again. Exhale. Again. Exhale. So I could not palpate the lower border of the liver in this patient. For the upper border, the best method is percussion. For percussion, we can begin in the second intercostal space, that is right next to the ziphi sternum, which is the protuberance on the sternum, not the ziphi sternum, sorry, the maneuverum. And you'll start percussing down in each intercostal space and look for a change in the resonant node towards a dull node. So once we have a change from resonant to dull, we'll know that this is the upper border of the liver. So now I have a done note. This is probably the sixth intercostal space moving down. The ideal way of measuring the liver span is locating this upper border and locating the lower border if we do find one on palpation and measure it through an inch tape. In case we have not found it, we can simply measure it towards the right postal margin and this should be in the mid clavicular line. Using an inch tape, we can assess this. And this is around 4 inches. For the next part, we will be examining or palpating the spleen. The splenic enlargement always occurs towards the right iliac fossa. Therefore, it is important to begin our palpation from that end so that we don't miss the lower border. As the spleen is relatively softer and harder to palpate. Again, the same principles will be followed of breathing pattern and the radial finger, uh, the radial side of your index finger. Locating the coastal margin and orienting our hand with that margin. Take a deep breath in for me. Exhale. Deep breath in. 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 Exhale. In a normal individual, the spleen should not be palpable. But if you have doubts, you can actually do a maneuver to enhance the palpation of the spleen. For that, you can both tuck the skin on the left side of the patient and may allow for an easier palpation. And also ask the patient to tilt towards your end. This will just bring the spleen slightly downwards and make it easier to palpate. Can you turn slightly towards this side? That's you. Take a deep breath. Another one, and again, exhale, thank you, you can now reset. So I cannot palpate the splenic border in this patient. Another way, which is also a part of percussion, is to just see the top is the space, which is the space overlying the gastric body. If that space is dull due to splenic enlargement, it can be felt on percussion. Otherwise, in normal individuals, it will stay resonant or tympanic. The tobis space is located, is formed in a triangular fashion by the sixth rib on the superior border 
the postal margin on the lower border and the mid axillary line on its lateral end. So locating the sift strip using the space method and then locating the postal margin, we can just focus for this space. This is a normal tympanic node, which indicates lack of splenomegaly. For the kidneys, the bimanual method of palpation is used. The kidneys are bellotable, unlike the other visceral organs, which means they can float in between your two hands. The two methods of bimanual palpation which are used, I'll be demonstrating each on each end. So for the right kidney, I'll be demonstrating the first method. For the first method, you need to keep your left hand on the anterior side and your right hand beneath over the posterior flank region. And you need to press both at the same time as the patient breathes. Can you breathe in for me? You need to feel if the kidney comes and strikes your anterior hand. This is the first method. It is not so ideal because mostly the kidney does not move as much with respiration being a retroperitoneal organ unlike the intraperitoneal organs of liver and spleen. The second method is a bit more reliable. For that method, we'll move to the left side of the patient and the left kidney can be bellowed. So for this, we'll now move our right hand beneath on the right, uh, flank region and the left hand on the anterior region. And we'll keep our anterior hand static while we just push from our posterior hand and try to feel if we can have the kidney coming and striking our hand. In a normal individual, if the patient is lean, the kidneys can be bellowed, but otherwise not. Otherwise, only in, kidna in large states of kidney, such as polycystic kidney disease, we'll find an easily enlarged kidney. When we do have a kidney mass that is palpated like this, we need to be able to differentiate it from a splenic mass. A kidney mass does not have a notch, unlike the spleen which has a notch on its lower border you can get above the kidney unlike the spleen and you can also bell up the kidney just like I explained previously now we'll move on to percussion percussion is important for two parts of the assessment the first part is assessment of the ascites if there is any and the second part is assessment of the bladder if it is distended for ascites the method of percussion that we use is called the shifting dullness test so for that We'll move in an L-shaped maneuver starting from the midline and percuss all the way down to the flank. Normally, in, in normal individuals, the note should be tympanic both in the midline and all the way throughout the flank. If there is ascites, however, we will find a change from tympanic to dull because the fluid settles in the flank regions rather than the top regions. The top region is occupied by the bowel loops due to buoyancy. And now, if assuming that the patient does have a dull note here, which the patient does not, we will now ask the patient to tilt towards the other side. Can you tilt towards the other side? Keeping our hand there, we'll wait for 30 seconds and then percuss again. If the note changes from dull to tympanic, this is indicative of a positive shifting dullness test and indicates the presence of free fluid which is ascites, rather than a fluid-filled cavity that is a static. We'll now try to percuss again. Thank you. We can also do it for the other side, but one side is enough. Another test that we use for ascites is the fluid thrill test. For that test to be valid, only massive ascites is needed. So if there is massive ascites, we can elicit a fluid thrill by asking the patient to keep their hand in the midline like this. Can you keep your hand in the midline like this? We'll use our other hand to put it on the right side, on the left side of the patient, sorry. And we'll elicit a thrill in the fluid if there is any on from this side. If the thrill is palpated on our other hand, it indicates a positive fluid thrill test. The hand acts as a barrier so that no impulse is transmitted through the wall and only the fluid conducts the impulse. Once we are done with that, we can percuss for the bladder, going all the way down from the midline and looking for a change in note from tympanic to dull as the bladder is fluid filled and is dull.
I could not no note any dull note. This indicates that the bladder is not distended or is not enlarged. There are three components that we need to assess on auscultation. The first one are gut sounds or bowel sounds. The second one are bruits. And the third one are rub sounds that can be seen over the liver and the spleen. So for auscultation of bowel sounds, we need to auscultate just towards the right of the umbilicus as this indicates the region of the ileocecal valve and has the highest motility. We need to ideally auscultate for at least two minutes before ruling out absent bowel sounds. Another way of assessing bowel sounds is to assess all four quadrants on each side of the umbilicus 15 seconds each. Next, to assess for the bruis, we need to locate the aorta and the renal arteries and auscultate over them. The aorta is just located slightly superior to the umbilicus. For renal vessels, we just move slightly lateral towards it. And for the right renal vessel, If we had found splenic or liver enlargement on palpation, we'll then auscultate over the liver and spleen to assess for a rub sound that can be seen in cases of inflammation. That is just done by locating and putting it on the lower border of the liver. And with breathing, if there is a rub sound, that is indicative of inflammation. Similarly for the spleen. That's it. Once the examination is completed, we'll now cover the patient again. Thank you for your cooperation. For completion of my examination, I would like to further perform a digital rectal exam and the inguinous portal exam. And if I had any findings, relevant examination towards that. Thank you so much.